Okay, so I am now recording, just so everyone's aware. Um, so I think we'll get started. Uh, my name's Katie Parry. I'm one of the co-conveners of the Political Studies Association Media and Politics Group. And there's a couple of other conveners that I can see um, joining today, Alec and, and Jen. Uh, so this is actually the first in um, a series of seminars. And really this was to kind of try and keep up our sense of, of community and seeing each other. We're all missing each other very much. And obviously we haven't been able to, to have our usual conference last year. Uh, and I know everyone kind of tends to be a bit Zoom fatigued, uh, but at the same time, it is really lovely to see some familiar faces and names. Um, and we hope to be carrying on this as a, as a monthly event and we'll be in touch with fu about future events as well. So I'm delighted to welcome Lorna Sorison today as um, our first speaker and we're doing a book launch for Lorna's book which is called Populist Communication, Ideology, Performance and Mediation. Uh, and so we'll start as a Q&A and then for about 25 minutes, half an hour and then we'll open it up to your questions. So please do use the group chat um, or raise your hand uh, once we're ready for that. So a reminder to please mute if you can and um, we'll get started. As I say, I'm delighted to welcome Lorna for this first session. Uh, I should declare my kind of interests. Uh, I was one of Lorna's supervisors for her PhD alongside Professor Katrin Voltmer. Uh, so I do know this work to some degree, although I believe she has very much uh, adapted it as well for the book version. Uh, so first of all, just to start us off, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about how the book project came about and your inspiration for this project? Hi, yeah, thanks Katie. Um, yeah, I get, I mean, as you say, it grew out of my thesis, but I've also added some, um, some new chapters and developed the analysis somewhat um, since then. And I started in 2013 when, um, just to get a sense of the landscape of populism scholarship at the time, I, I felt I had to go to every conference that had a panel on populism. And if you did that today, it would be a full-time job in and of itself. Um, there was so little out there that was going on, but it was just emerging. So it was quite exciting. Um, but I guess the approach I take in the book is based partly on some observations of, of real life politics and partly on observations of the scholarship. Um, so in terms of um, actual politics out there in the real world, it was very noticeable that populism operates in the new media environment in a particularly deft and agile way um, compared to a lot of establishment politics. And in particular, I was interested in the way in which it fits somehow with the norms and styles of social media. So um, things like the use of slang and humor fits very well with um, the way populists communicate in other spheres of life. Um, you quite often see images on uh, Twitter of Farage and his phishing tweets, that kind of thing, quite personalized and private um, anecdotes. Um, but it also fits with the ideas and imaginaries of some social media platforms. So UKIP had a very common hashtag called People's Army, which very much resonated with the public ideas of the role that social media played in the outspring, for example. Um, and this idea of emancipation and uh, a kind of anti-elite movement. Um, so that was one side of it, this, this fit with the new media environment. Another one, another side of, of what you could observe was this very disruptive behavior that was happening by populists all over the world. And in South Africa, one of the uh, case studies they look at, the EFF, Economic Freedom Fighters, their argument was that in that particular environment of a transitional democracy, the only effective performance of opposition was through disrupting the establishment or disrupting the government, um, where you had this, this context of a lack of democratic engagement and accountability by the government. Um, so they would disrupt the president's speeches and there would be um, violence and lots of fun and games. Um, in 
the case of UKIP, which was my other case study, you had this very dry and formal environment of the European Parliament where disruption took a different form. It was quite relative to the kind of context it disrupted, but the use of humor and different kinds of provocations and symbolic actions was very much the way that UKIP got their message across. Um, and I think it was also in these disruptions, it was about recognizing that there is a truth in populism, that it captures a certain political mood amongst parts of the population. Um, and these disruptions, uh, quite clearly um, took the form of a kind of strategic form of truth telling that identified a fault line in representative democracy where there's a sense that citizens and elites no longer connect both in the South African and the, the British context and the disruptions brought those fault lines to light but it also deepened them at the same time. Um, so yeah that was another side of it and then finally it was also looking at, at these kind of uh, dynamics that were similar in established and transitional democracies. Uh, there were similar problems about this divide between elites and citizens, and there were similar ways that populists went about bringing it to light and, um, and communicating meaning. Um, so this comparative approach I'm taking of comparing across two very different contexts was also an attempt to overcome the north-south divide that we find um, in most scholarship still and especially in populism scholarship, it was as if those who were looking at uh, the West thought that populism was uniquely a Western phenomenon. Those who were looking at transitional democracy said it was a phenomenon that was unique to transitional democracy. Um, and actually, I think those two bodies of literature and uh, practitioners as well could learn a lot from each other. Thank you so much. That, that covers so much so lovely and brilliantly and and i think that is you know it's such a brilliant book and it's so theoretically rich as well as empirically rich and as you say actually bringing together a british case study with a south african case study and being able to look at populist communication in both of those contexts um is, is a real fantastic contribution uh, to to the field um so in terms of we're going to come back a little bit to to disruption later as well because i think that again is, is one of the really interesting ideas that you develop in the book um but first of all we've already noted that the the subheadings are ideology performance and mediation so could you tell us a little bit about these three concepts because the book is structured according to these three concepts so how do these three different parts play a role in, in your approach to populist communication? Yeah, so the structure of the book, as you say, is in, in these three different parts, in ideology, performance and, um, and mediation, and that structure is quite theoretically driven. So um, as core concepts, I can see those as together comprising three aspects of the populist communication process, uh, which is what I conceptualize in the book. Um, so in the ideology part, I take a slightly different approach to populist ideology than, than the mainstream scholarship, which tends to focus on um, populist ideology as a system of beliefs. Um, and I'm taking more of a process approach where I'm looking at, at the sort of very malleable and spongy and responsive nature of populist ideas. Um, not as a limitation to conceptualizing populism as an ideology, but as its core strength, as that what, as what character, characterizes the ideational aspect of, of populism. So I see it as a kind of bottom-up ideology that's absorbent, that absorbs the actual grievances and concerns of citizens and the perceptions of democracy in a particular political culture, which makes it very contextual and responsive as a phenomenon. Um, so it's this kind of process of absorbing um, elements of political culture and, and that makes it very contextual and that I think makes populism particularly flexible and the um, buzzword is chameleonic or uh, like a chameleon from, from Taggart's work, of course. Um, and I think that partly highlights that we need to pay attention to this underlying fault line that populism highlights, that populism in and of itself is not the problem, it's a symptom that brings to light these structural and communicative problems in uh, representative democracy. 
Um, but what I also argue in, 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 in this part is that these absorbed ideas then are projected through uh, um, or filtered by certain storytelling principles um, that characterize populism. So there's a moral essentialism that enters the narrative uh, that denotes the relationship between the people and the elite in populism. So Farage would always go on in the European Parliament about uh, his fellow MEPs never having done a day's work in their lives. And there was very much a moral dimension to this, this gap between elites and citizens. Um, another storytelling principle is around mimesis. So um, this is about the relationship between the people and the populist being uh, one of identification. So Farage would always turn up with his or have a photo opportunity with his pint of bitter and the EFF would always dress in um, uh, like a domestic workers uniform and overalls rather than in, in the gray suits of the elite. And then finally, there's, there's a principle of exceptionalism as well. So this is partly to do with the relationship between the populist and the elite, where the populist kind of differentiates himself from um, the standard elite, political elite, but also between the populist and the people, because the populist has a kind of exceptional insight into the political process that no one else has that uh, enables him to be the truth teller with a sort of epistemological privilege, this exceptionalism in, in his position. Um, so the story that populists, or the ideas that populists adopt and absorb from, from political culture are then projected back in a kind of modified form. Um, in the performance part, I then talk more about um, this projection and, and how these ideas are externalized. And I think performance is becoming a really important emerging emerging concepts in, in, uh, in politics um, that's more interdisciplinary. So this is performance not in a pejorative sense, like you hear political pundits talk about political theater and this kind of thing. It's more of an analytical lens that allows us to think about how meaning is constructed and negotiated with an audience in mind and projected through both textual and paralinguistic forms like gesture and tone of voice and facial expression, but also the use of spaces and props. Um, so it very much pays attention to the symbolic in, in political communication. Um, and in this part, I focus on um, disruption. Uh, disruptive performance is a particularly important part of populism, but also on authenticity um, as something that um, is essential to, to how uh, populists see politics working and how they see um, their own mode of political representation functioning. Um, and then in the last part, I talk about mediation. So um, practically all um, representative relationships are mediated. So this is, this is not, uh, obviously we have, um, I think largely a political communication uh, group of people here, but in the political science um, literature, um, it's easy to forget sometimes that, that this process is not a, a neutral or unproblematic process, that there are institutional norms and ideals of gatekeepers, there are media technologies and imaginaries that, um, that shape the meaning that's um, communicated through media. And in that part, I then discuss how populists anticipate these processes of mediation, but also build them into performative repertoires that speak to different parts of the media ecology. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, like you say, performance is such a, an, an interesting area uh, that seems to be getting more attention now within uh, politics. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about the book is, is bringing in these different literatures and the way that you interweave those different literatures so that you can really look at the symbolism, the aesthetics, um, as well as uh, the more political concepts as well. Um, I think that is, is, is handled brilliantly in the book. Um, so as you've already kind of hinted at, there is this growing interest in populism. Um, and we've seen a huge increase in, in um, academic articles and, and scholarship generally. Uh, so one of the things that's particularly um, been developed 
is this relationship with the media and thinking about media and communication. And so what do you kind of feel that you add in this book that is different or new to those debates? So I think um, a lot of scholarship on populism and, and the media tends to look at either social media or traditional media. Um, and especially in the traditional media uh, area, there's a tendency to, to take a, a quite institutionalist approach. And I'm trying to look at a more integrated um, approach to the media ecology where um, I'm thinking more about how populists kind of uh, develop complementary acts that are targeted at different parts of the media ecology and at different audiences within it. Um, and one thing that, that I think they're very good at is uh, partly adapting their message and style to a particular media environment or platform or technology um, and set of norms, and partly at um, making sure that there's consistency between the different messages that they, that they um, um, transmit. So you have these different stages, if you like, or platforms that have different norms um, and disruption, when it is at its most provocative, will be in an institutional setting where populists will disrupt the norms of, of institutional politics and do things that you wouldn't normally do in formal politics. But they can use other platforms like social media, for instance, where those kind of acts that are really provocative and out of place in an institutional context will attract the attention of mainstream media there, um, but can be legitimized on social media where the same kind of language and dress or kind of behavior is basically the norm uh, and just denotes that the populist is one of the people is an ordinary kind of guy and it, and you get this kind of consistency across the different platforms that suggest that the populist in in his own private life is the same kind of person as they would be in their institutional disruptive performance so this kind of uh, consistency denotes an authenticity that established politics doesn't have and that is exactly what populists are trying to expose in the elite this lack of authenticity that they denote as uh, essentially being improper representation deceitful yeah i mean you do you do talk in the book about how the, there is almost this contradictory element there is this sort of paradox at the heart of of what populists are doing in terms of the way that they deal with this idea of being um, both of the people, but then having that epistemological privilege as, as well. Um, so one of the things we've touched on already is this idea of disruptive performance. And of course, disruption is, is, is again, quite a, a key kind of concept, especially in uh, social media as well. Um, so why do you think that this disruption and disruptive performance is a particularly uh, important part of, of a particularly important concept for your book? I think there's um, both an empirical use and uh, a theoretical importance to it. So it's where I see populism coming to its fullest expression and where it interacts most explicitly with citizen audiences with media gatekeepers as well and with institutional politics so it establishes these different relationships with these groups of people in very particular ways um so because it's so expressive it's a really advantageous object of study for qualitative research and for purposive sampling um but conceptually i think it's also at the core of what populism does um, so in terms of this relationship that it establishes with institutional politics and the elite, it's expository. It exposes the elite's wrongdoings and misrepresentations, supposedly. Um, in terms of the media, it provides spectacle. And in terms of, of the audience and citizens, um, it performs a certain form of self-representation where the populace can identify with ordinary people as an outsider to politics, um, but also perform this role of truth teller of, of exposing the elite and, and giving people a view of what is really supposedly going on in politics. Um, so in one of the case studies that I look at in, in South Africa, 
um, the State of the Nation Address, the EFF um, continuously disrupt the president's speech and end up delaying his speech for over an hour um, by challenging various institutional norms, but never the legal foundation. Um, and it attracts a massive amount of media attention. It gets the biggest Twitter audience that South Africa has ever seen. Um, but it also manages to provoke a reaction from the elite by building this up months in advance and provoking the president and the ANC to the point where the only thing that they seem capable of doing is to step in and stop this disruption by the use of uh, riot police in the parliamentary chamber, which is a breach of the constitution, violence erupts. So essentially um, provoking the government to enact violence in parliament legitimate, legitimates the disruption in the first place and proves the EFF's narrative right that the government is corrupt and acting as a, in a sort of form of a second second instance of apartheid, essentially. Um, but I think it's also about what disruptive performance doesn't do. Um, it does not present a program for the future um, that is sometimes supplied by a host ideology in populism, um, but primarily it is reactionary and it's contextual. It, it relates to a particular um, institutional and cultural context. Um, so, and, and yeah, that context is important as well. It's that which is disrupted um, plays a big role. So it's very much a relational concept that al allows us to think about different institutional contexts, the different political cultures, but also different media and platform cultures. Um, and then disruption in relation to those uh, enables a kind of, um, makes a symbolic point about politics and it creates a very visceral experience of it that you don't otherwise get in institutional politics. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, I, I think as well, something you write about is, is the way in which they draw upon those kind of national mythologies as well. Um, so as you say, with, with the economic freedom fighters, that's, that's, um, the, the apartheid period and, and who has the who is the real kind of uh, freedom fighters uh, who has lost their way um, and then in the UK obviously the the kind of references to the Second World War that we see in, in the Brexit debates and um, so it's quite interesting that uh, use of the past in terms of this storytelling uh, and then one of the other things that we've touched on as well is this idea of truth telling, because I think as well, people might not associate populists with truth telling. Um, so um, what can you tell us about that, a bit more about that? I think this has been one of the most interesting um, parts of this research. And it wasn't something, like you say, it's not something we, we associate with populism necessarily. It wasn't something I expected to find. It was very much a theme that emerged from my analysis of the data. Um, I think we can distinguish between um, a, a sort of reconstructed populist narrative about politics that I've very much found was shared um, between these very different types of populism, of left and right wing populism, but also uh, populism in, in both established and transitional democracy. Um, and then on the other hand, an analysis of how that narrative is constructed. Um, so in the narrative itself, populists proclaim themselves to be truth tellers and to expose the elite as liars. It's very central in, in all their communications. So Farage in the, in the European Parliament would um, expose MEPs as a mafia-like cartel. And when he's reprimanded by the, by the chair, he says he refuses to pay homage to any institutional norms in the European Parliament. He will only pay homage to the truth um, and, and the argument here is that these kind of norms of politics are what enable the elite to deceive the people. And that's why populists have to expose them. But through the analysis of how this kind of narrative is constructed, what emerged was um, that, that populists rely on these two types of authenticity. So one is a self-connected form of authenticity, uh, um, according to which essentially the populist uh, is true to himself, unlike elite politicians in their narrative. Uh, but it's also a responsive authenticity whereby populists are true to the uh, 
the needs and values of the people. Um, and those two types of authenticity that populists would deem essential to democratic representation as, and as lacking in the elite, but they essentially also equate them to an absolutist notion of truth with a capital T that very much appeals to feelings of uncertainty and to distrust in the current political communication environment. Um, and I think this is something I really want to carry on working on, this notion of truth telling and destabilizing the epistemological foundation of politics. I find that really um, well, partly a lot of fun to engage with, but also really pertinent in, in what we are experiencing at the moment in politics. Yeah, because of, of course the populism debates have, have sort of come along at the same time as post-truth or post-shame politics. And I know you also talk about uh, defactualization um, as, as another concept as well. So, um, so that was all my questions. Hopefully I haven't tired Lorna out too much uh, with those questions and people have got some questions of their own. Uh, if you can use the raise hand function, if you'd like to ask a question, um, or you could write it in the chat if you prefer, prefer to write or um, rather not kind of speak. Um, but we've already got uh, Teo, is it? Uh, so please do uh, give us your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank and congratulations, Loan. Uh, it's been such a I mean, I, I still haven't read the book, so but uh, but I'm basing myself on what you on the previous work. But I'm really excited about it. I mean, uh, I share a lot of affinities with your with the approach you, you use, and I think your work is really important, especially on political communication. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, sorry, uh, so I have a few questions. So I'm gonna I'm going to go uh, quickly at them. Sorry, I tried to take note, but it was a bit quick. Um, the first one is you, you talked. Uh, uh, in an earlier part of a discussion about the ideal, ideological dimension of populism. So I wanted uh, to ask if you could elaborate a bit on what you mean by that exactly, because you know that this choice of wording resonates a lot with the literature on populism, particularly mood and the, the mainstream. And it is a surprising choice since with your focus on performance, authenticity, theatricality, your approach has a lot more affinity with uh, the social cultural, the performative and the, or even the approach of populism as a style. So I really wonder if you could and you also talked about host ideology, which seems to hint at the idea that populism is different from an ideology. So I want you, I wanted you to know uh, to uh, to uh, to ask a bit more about like what is this distinction? What is purely ideational or ideological in populism, and and how does this uh, co combine with this? The second one is, uh, is is related to the point that you made about the fact that populists are are very adaptable to the media ecology that they change their act towards different audiences. And, I, and it seems to me that uh, it's the feature of any, or at least it's a necessity for any successful politician to change their act and to adapt, you know, to be good on Twitter, to be good at. So is there something specific or is it, or is being media savvy a feature of populism or is it something different? And the last one is your, is your concept of uh, disruption, which I really appreciate because I'm trying to work on, the, on, on a similar idea on, on transgression. And my question to, for you is, um, you probably know of Pierre Rostigui's work on the flaunting of populism as flaunting of the law, you know, the high, the law, and this idea that populism is on the law. And so my question to you is, is disruption necessarily on the law? Because in the, in the, the only article I've read, but I need to read the book to know more, you, you, you talk about the use of slang, of swearing, offensive, disrespectful language, but, and I wonder if uh, disruption can be only in the, on the, is it only on the law or can it happen on the high or is it, uh, so yeah. Thank you, that was long and uh, I'm excited to, to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Theo, it's nice to see you again. Um, yeah, so with, with ideology, um, I'm not taking the same approach to ideology as, um, as Muda does. I think um, uh, Michael Frieden's uh, work on, on uh, the morphology of ideology is really interesting, but not as suited to populism as it is to um, other ideologies. Um, and I think he, he argues this himself as well. So I think the ideological aspect of populism, and I'm not classifying populism as an ideology, just to be clear, I'm looking at it both as ideology and performance. Um, but I want to acknowledge that ideas play a big role in, in populism in terms of how we differentiate it from other phenomena. Um, 
but I'm more interested in how those ideas come about and how they play out. And that's, so it's, it's more of a processual understanding of, of ideology than the political science approaches that look more at the structure of, of uh, political concepts and systems of belief. Um, and then you had a uh, question about adaptability to media. Um, so I think there are qualities inherent to populism that makes it particularly attractive to media. Um, so one of these, one of these is, is the, um, the, the providing the spectacular, um, but also being able to, uh, in some cases, give media the excuse of um, succumbing to uh, commercial imperatives rather than democratic ones by enabling the argument that this is particularly supported by a large group of ordinary people who are not normally being heard. Um, and on social media, there is this kind of affinity with, with the style and language and, and the norms of use, I think, that elite politicians find very difficult to make consistent with their other, other public communications because the style does not suit the institutional and formal requirements of political talk. Um, but because populists disrupt those, those, those norms, they can enable this consistency on social media and, and the way they, they act in institutional politics. Um, and then you had a question about disruption and I hope you get a chance to talk more about this because I'd love to hear more about your work on this as well. And I, I'll hope, I hope to catch your presentation over the next couple of days. But um, um, yeah, I think, I think it is necessarily low, but it's relative, right? So um, I think disruption always it disrupts a particular context and something that's disruptive in one context is not necessarily disruptive in another context, um, which is also why I think you, you find populism taking so many different forms around the world where there are different norms and different political cultures, um, all norm, different norms and different media platforms. So you can say something highly provocative in one context that's just absolutely normal if you say it on Facebook or something else, right? Um, so it is, it is relatively low uh, because it necessarily disrupts an elitist discourse. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing about your work on transgression as well. Um, Emily, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, first and uh, most importantly, I just want to say congratulations. What an achievement. Um, and then I was going to ask you, when you say you've been doing it since 2013, I'm really struck by how much the world has changed and these issues, particularly we've seen so many people rise and fall during that time. And I wondered if that was one of the challenges of writing the book and how you try to connect with or reflect the, the events that have been happening. Yeah, I think in some ways I was relatively lucky compared to others because one of the arguments that has undergone quite a lot of change in populism studies is this idea that um, that you can't really have populists in power because they can't sustain their narrative of anti-elitism once they are the elite themselves but at the same time uh, quite a few of them have proven themselves quite successful but my focus has always been on opposition parties um, primarily because I think disruption is more pronounced in those parties. Um, but yeah, that, that has certainly made my work easier. Um, I think when you look at um, people like Trump and some of the more um, embedded uh, populists that have gained power, um, actually a lot of this still holds true, but, the, but disruption perhaps takes different forms. So you see more uh, legal um, disruptions. You see Trump's use, Trump's way of conducting politics, for instance, on Twitter and international relations or public diplomacy. You see changes to constitutions and things that um, where where it, it's quite a different kind of not a different phenomenon, but different spheres that they act within and that are, that, are, that they're able to affect change in. Um, that would be really interesting to look at now that we've got that experience. 
Thanks, Emily. Um, Stephen, you have a question? Oh, you need to unmute, Stephen. I'm always doing this. Um, okay, I know all the good things about this um, this work. I'm familiar with it, and of course, it's 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 really valuable. But I want to press you on a couple of things um, that are, about which I want to be more critical. Um, I guess the first is is what I might call a kind of discursive tone, not only in yours but in a lot of writing and speaking about populism. Um, I would describe it colloquially as being a bit sniffy, that is to say, um, as if you're in the presence of a bit of a bad smell. Um, and so I want to sort of try to understand that and I want to understand what it is that you think you need to be saying about populism in a way that you might not need to be saying about uh, the current Italian government, for example, if you were trying to analyze that. You're making, I think, some kind of a normative statement about how politics should be. Um, and it seems that part of what you're saying is that these people are transgressive in the sense that they either don't understand the rules of the game, or they do understand the rules of the game, but they take pleasure in breaking it, breaking them. Uh, is, is, is that a problem? Is that a good thing? Is that something that we should sort of instinctively from a political science position say we want to see less of? Not quite sure what is being implied here, but the reason I'm pressing you on it is because it's one of those things that's always implicit in the argument, but never really stated. And of course, those kind of arguments where there are these big implicit claims can be very problematic because you end up kind of agreeing because you agree, but not quite knowing what you agree on. So I'm gonna urge you to focus on that question by asking a very precise empirical question that you can relate it to. Was Jeremy Corbyn a populist? Um, if he was, then why was he? And if he wasn't, then why wasn't he? I've got a second question I want to press you on, but other people can go first and we may never get to it. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I do deal with the normative aspects um, in, in the book, but um, I think populists do understand the rules of the game and they understand them very, very well. They know exactly what they're doing when they're breaking the norm. So I think I see these as very intentional and self-aware acts. Um, I think Corbyn was also self-aware in breaking certain norms um, of, of institutional politics. And I think he did have a charismatic performance to some audiences. Um, when you see that video of him at Glastonbury, uh, it kind of, um, it is so emotionally contagious, I think. Um, but I don't think that is necessarily the core of populism. I, don't, I wouldn't classify Corbyn as a populist um, because I don't think he has the um, more reductive qualities that are also associated with it. And, and that's where the, the implicit or explicit uh, a normative side comes in. So um, I think that populists essentially um, have an argument that is worth listening to because it brings to light something that is not allowed to surface otherwise in politics. Um, but it's it's used strategically in such a way as to favor the populists rather than the people that populists speak up for. Um, I think it has some very beneficial effects in certain contexts. So for instance, in the South African case, um, I think it's true that disruption is the only way of performing opposition. And there was an absolute need for ensuring accountability in a transitional democracy um, where it couldn't have been achieved, been achieved through um, more um, norm compliant means. Um, but once Zuma was out of power, uh, the EFF are just looking for another opportunity to um, find their way in. And I certainly wouldn't um, trust that they would uh, establish this 
more listening and um, relationship to citizens and the more uh, the, the handing over of agency to citizens that they claim. Um, I think that lies in the claim, not in, not in the actions that we have seen also of, of populists in power. Um, could, and, you, could you just say a bit more, not about why populists are populist, but why Corbyn wasn't a populist? Um, I think this is. I think this is partly to do with the homogenization of the people that the populist projects. Um, so it is very reductive. The 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 distinction that populists construct between elites and citizens is essentialist and moralizing. Um, and I don't think Corbyn did that. I think he was more um, nuanced in his acknowledgement of different types of elites and different types of citizens with different opinions. I don't think he reduced people to one particular identity, um, either on the elite side or on the citizen side. And that's what I think populists do. Um, and that's why even though they have quite often positive role to play in terms of, especially in opposition, in terms of uh, giving a representative democracy that has stalled, but is going in the wrong direction, a bit of a jolt, which it might need. They, they quite often serve a very necessary function that other forms of politics couldn't. Then I think in the long term, it's unsustainable and it doesn't deliver on the promises that it has. Thanks, Lorna. Stephen's nodding. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm nodding to acknowledge that I heard the answer. I'm, I'm, shaking, I'm shaking my head internally. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. That's always nice to hear. Um, okay, we have a, a question um, in the chat as well from Antal. Um, so can there be democratic politics and more specifically political campaigning politician to citizen communication without populist elements so when does rapport between decision makers and citizens become populist as opposed to non-populist thanks santa thank you yeah so i think um this is sort of going back to to definitions of populism and how to delineate it from politics more broadly. So um, I'm not taking the very broad uh, Laclaudian definition of populism, um, which in which it almost kind of um, merges with, with uh, politics in a certain sense, um, but as something that is, is narrower and um, like I said, more focused on um, or has, has a reductive element to it. Um, I think the political campaigning is not necessarily disruptive or norm-breaking. It's not necessarily, um, it always constructs a particular people and speaks to a particular constituency, um, but there are different ways of, of um, constructing that constituency and, and projecting a particular identity onto it. And of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be identity politics either. Um, so I think this, yeah, there's a lot of different dimensions to uh, what makes uh, political campaigning in general, where populism is, is, is narrow, focused on um, on particular performative practices and particular ideas of giving voice to, supposedly giving voice to um, a group of citizens that feel that they're not being represented otherwise. Thanks, Antal. It, I mean, it seems as well like kind of just picking up on what people have been saying that there's almost these sort of thresholds, but these thresholds need to kind of be across the three concepts you're talking about, you know, ideology, performance and the relationship with the media. So often we kind of when we're trying to define if someone's populist or not, we kind of look to each of those ideas. Um, and perhaps is, is, it, is there a kind of sense of even though you need to re retain a flexibility because of the different political cultures and different contexts, that there's a sense in which they need to be kind of coming 
so high on kind of both across all three of these um, areas, really. Yeah, I think I actually think it's really difficult and takes a lot of in-depth engagement with a particular political leader or party to tell whether they're populist or not. I, I don't really agree with the two clear-cut definitions in a, in a sense, and um, certainly the performative aspect of populism is also something that can be adopted temporarily and then dropped again by political actors who uh, do it for campaigning purposes, also in, in response to the health question. Um, but I think some of the core ideas are important to still pay attention to, that, that there is a certain, a certain story that populists tell that is unique to populists um, about how politics works. Um, sorry, can you, was there something else in your question, Katie, that I might have forgotten? No, no, I guess I was just sort of um, joining in on this general thing of trying to sort of um, see at what point we can define someone as, as a populist um, and, and just think and I think what the book subtitle kind of tells us is we need to look across each of these kind of areas of ideology performance and mediation um, uh, does anyone else have have a question um, please do raise your hand or or write in the chat I don't know Stephen if you had did you say you had another one that you wanted to come back on if we had time? Well, I'm happy to be a filler while people think if that's, <laughs> that's usually my function in life. But um, yeah, I want to just go then to this question about representation that um, you talk about. And in fact, it's in, in the kind of blurb for this event. And you say that you know, non-populist representation is based on expertise and experience, but populist representation is based on three things. And they are an ephemeral sense of authenticity, direct connection to citizens and certainty of the truth they tell. Well, I think the issue about certainty of the truth is is, is pretty defining and, and, you know, almost inherently problematic in politics that, that anybody who approaches disagreement on the basis that they are certain that what they are saying is the truth have got something wrong. But what's the problem about representation having more to do with a direct connection to citizens? And what's a problem about a sense of authenticity? I mean, you say it's an ephemeral sense of authenticity. I don't quite know what you mean by the adjective. Obviously, if it's in a sense of authenticity that's kind of here today and gone tomorrow and isn't consistent, then that's a problem. But I'm not sure if that's what you're saying. So it's this question, what is it about this move towards authenticity and a greater connection to the represented that you see as being in some ways problematic for democracy? Um, all of it's not necessarily problematic to democracy, I think. Um, I think there's um, very much a point to populist um, injection of authenticity in politics because it's something that's very much lacking and or performed badly by um, a lot of elite politicians. And I keep thinking about um, Theresa May dancing. Um, but um, it's, um, it's a problem when it's to the exclusion of other forms of truth um, or fact. Um, I think the directness takes many different forms and directness in, in representation is certainly not necessarily a bad thing. Again, populists have a point in that respect, that, that directness is lacking in current forms of representation or certainly a feeling that there is a directness, a, a, a path through to the ears of uh, those that are meant to represent us. Um, and it takes a lot of different forms, but quite often in populist performances, they are symbolic. Um, so in their use of social media, for instance, um, and I've seen this in other studies of populism and social media as well, what I found was that there is a claim to be directly connected to uh, other users of, of social media, um, but they don't actually respond to anything or answer people 
um, who comment on their tweets or Facebook posts. Um, so it's very much a symbolic directness rather than an actual use of the affordances of digital media. Um, other forms of directness also include this kind of sense that the populist is um, not a mediator in the sense of an, what a normal representative would be who filters opinions. Um, instead, the populist is simply some kind of um, a, a medium in, in the oracular sense, right? Who simply voices the voice of the people, whether it's um, contradictory or not, is less of a, it's, that's not really an issue. It almost doesn't exist, the contradictions between different, different voices within the population because the people are homogenized. Um, so that filtering process that a political representative would normally undertake is eliminated and the argument is that that filtering process would normally distort people's opinions. Um, so you get that sense of directness or a claim to directness, which isn't really possible in actual representation. Thanks, Lorna. Um, we've got a, a couple of comments and questions in the, the chat. Uh, so Bill says, have you or might you benefit from some modifier of populism, such as an ideological populist, something to distinguish your focus from others? Sorry, where was that? Physically? It's in the chat. Um, I don't know. It, it says, have you, it's from Bill Dutton, um, have you or might you benefit from some modifier of populism, such as an ideological populist, something to distinguish your focus from others? Yeah, there's a really interesting paper by um, Steen Wen Kessel, who's talking about different dimensions. So one is ideological, another stylistic, where the ideological is more a question of um, persistent belief over time, and the stylistic is one dimension that can be dropped or picked up at convenience kind of thing. Um, so that might be interesting to think about developing. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Emily, did you did you have your hand up again? Yes, I do. Sorry, my dog's having a really noisy dream in the background. <laughs> if you hear anything strange. Um, I was going to ask you about um, durability. At one point you said that populists have no vision of the future. And I wondered if that meant that they were in some ways inherently kind of short of the phenomenon. I don't think necessarily that um, you need a vision of the future to be long lived, but I would just say that quite often the, 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 the political vision is, is provided by another element that combines with populism. Um, so you, you do have socialist forms of populism, you do have you know, um, right-wing forms of populism that develop in programs. And in fact, the South African case study I looked at, so it was quite noticeable that the relationship with a host ideology was quite variable in the different cases. In some cases, it's stronger than in others. And it allows uh, the populist party to develop a, a stronger program on the basis of the host ideology. So they had quite uh, a good, well, not good, but a, a detailed program of um, uh, a sort of socialist vision for what South Africa might be. Um, not necessarily good at all, actually. Um, but yeah, so I think the, the question of how long lived they are is more to do with whether the narrative is sustainable or not. Um, and whether uh, how long they can carry the uh, symbolic power of their message before people realize that they might not deliver on it. I mean, I, I think it's quite surprising how much they can get away with and how much people um, still feel that there is a truth to what is being said, but I think, I think this is to do with um, people listening to a different sense of truth than, than what other politicians denote to be truth. So if they think that people believe in what they're saying, um, then whatever they're saying doesn't matter. Or whether it has any bearing on reality doesn't matter. 
it's it's I think there's there's a changing um, changing uh, attitude to the role that politics politicians need to play and and the role that truth needs to play in politics. Sorry, you might be able to hear the ice cream van just outside my house. I'm sorry if you can hear that. Um, so there's a couple of, of comments. I think maybe you could write the name of the person who talked about um, ideological and stylistic dimensions, Lorna. Um, Teo wanted... Sorry, to... yeah, I, 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 you just mentioned very quickly a name and I, and I probably I just, just left my mind and I could not remember the name. So if you could just put it down there, I would be super happy. Oh, thank yeah. you. You just did. She's already done it. <laughs> She's that quick. Thank you. Um, so I think um, we're coming up to five and I know I think Lorna's even got another event to go to at five. So I don't want to overrun. Um, but I have added a flyer in the chat as well um, for you to to buy the book um, and get a discount. Um, as Lorna said, I think the ebook is now released, but the hardback uh, might be a little bit longer. Is that right, Lorna? Uh, the e yeah, I'm not. They haven't told me when it when the printed version is going to come out. I think the ebook is certainly on pre-order, and it should be available to order within the next day or two. Okay, thank you. So, so thanks once again. Um, it's been so, so nice to actually have a moment of intellectual nourishment uh, away from all the marking and everything that lots of us are doing right now. Uh, so, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and particularly thanks to Lorna for a fantastic session and it is a brilliant book. Um, it's a real triumph, I think, to bring together these, these different literatures. Thanks to everyone for coming. It's so nice to see so many people here. Thanks. Yeah, it is, it is so lovely to see everyone and some, some old friends and, and new faces. And as I say, we're going to try and do this monthly. I think we'll miss out August just because people tend to be away. But other than August, um, we'll be in touch. If you sign up to the MPG newsletter, uh, we'll let you know about the next session. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Katie. Bye.